Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker tonight is the award-winning author, Jonathan Mooney. Mr. Mooney is... Could you just wait a second, Davis? I think I hear someone's phone ringing. Oh, it's me. Oops, uh, hello? Who? Mr. Mooney? Yeah, this is Davis. Um, no, I'm actually doing your introduction right now. Uh, oh, well that's too bad. Um, okay, bye Mr. Mooney. What's the matter? Seems like Mr. Mooney's car broke down on the highway. What? What should we do? Well, I don't know, keep talking I guess. Hi! Yeah, that's all I got. Okay, call Mr. McAllister. FaceTime him. Great, I can get him on speed dial. Hi. Uh, he hello? Hi, Mr. McAllister? It's oh. Davis and Olivia. Hey, hello. Hi, hey. Mr. McAllister. Oh, hi, Olivia. Hi, Davis. What's up? Um, we got a bit of a problem, you see. Well, with the script? Oh, don't worry. Just, just make it up. The audience will never know. Uh, this time they might. Uh-oh. Okay, uh, hmm. What's the problem? It seems Mr. Mooney's car broke down. Do you think you could help him out? Um, sh sure, 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 we can do that. Yeah, no problem. Hey, Paul, can you airplay my phone on the big screen, please? Oh, you, oh, you are? Hey, everyone, say hi. Hi! Okay, remember Mr. Mooney, the gentleman who was at school yesterday? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. we have to keep an eye out for him, okay? Okay. All right, everyone look. Elle, what are you doing? Oh, I'm reading a chapter book, and it's the really exciting part. Oh, my gosh. Okay, JC. JC! Yeah, okay. I bought some math games. You did? Math games? Cool math games. Wow. I hated math, but now that the teachers take time to explain it, it's way more fun. Yeah, it's really fun, and not as hard as I thought it was. Oh, well, good for you guys. Hey, Nelson. What are you doing? What have you got? I brought a friend. Hi, Mr. McCaster. Well, hi, Carrie. But, Nelson, Carrie's your classmate. She's my classmate as well as my friend. Because there are only eight of us in our class, we have more time with the teacher and more time with our friends. Uh, I don't, but I still want to be leaving their own on the way of the road. Look! It's, it's Mr. Mr. Mooney! Hey, kids, thank, thanks for, for stopping us. I, 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 my car, my rental car broke down, and I have to get to the Marriott City Center for Grove Academy's Dream Big Gala tonight. Don't worry, Mr. Mooney. We'll get you there. That, that, that's great. I'm actually speaking there tonight. About what? Well, you know, I spent all day at Grove's yesterday, and I'm so excited to tell the audience what an amazing school it is, how having small classrooms and committed teachers and, and research best practices, how schools like that really change people's lives. We are pretty smart, Mr. Mooney. You bet you are smart, creative, different. It's kids like you that really change the world. Oh. Whoa. 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 Oh. I, think we're, I think we're here. Wow, that's a, that, that's a that's a big place. I hope I can find the room. Um, I'll, I'll take you there. We all need a short bus friend. Oh, man, you're right. We all need a short bus friend. Come on. Oh, yeah, my name is Jack, by the way. Hey, Jack, I'm Jonathan. Goodbye, Mr. Is Jack coming back? Well, looks like he made it. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's guest speaker is the founder and president of Project Eye to Eye, a mentoring and advocacy nonprofit organization for students with learning differences. He's also a dyslexic writer and activist who didn't learn to read until he was 12 years old. Please welcome Jonathan Mooney! We made it, brother. Yeah, we did. Oh, my goodness. Uh, they, they, they would have been super upset. Right in mid here. Oh, oh, come on. Yeah, totally. Let's go. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, while we're here, um, have fun, dream big. Here, thank you. <laughs> um, never get the budget rent a car. 
All right. <laughs> My name is Jonathan Mooney, and I am, uh, I'm so deeply honored and privileged to be spending some time with you tonight. Now, before I get to my piece here, I just want to ask you all for a moment to uh, recognize the young folks who are really the heart of this program. Can we give them a big round of applause for all they've done up here? I can't tell you how, uh, how deeply personal it is for me to be up here uh, celebrating and supporting Groves Academy. You know, I struggled in school. Uh, I was the kid who uh, spent most of the day chilling out with the janitor in the hallway, right? I was the kid in middle school who had such a hard time keeping his mouth shut that I grew up on a first name basis with Shirley the receptionist in the principal's office. And I was a kid in high school who had such a hard time learning to read, and specifically a torturous time reading out loud, that I spent most of my high school days hiding in the bathroom to escape reading out loud with tears streaming down my face. You know, as was mentioned, I didn't learn to read until I was 12 years old. I couldn't read until I was 12. I was diagnosed with dyslexia, or a language-based learning disability, in fourth grade. I was diagnosed with ADD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, in fifth grade. And I dropped out of school for a year in sixth grade. That year when I left school, 12 years old, I had a, a plan for suicide. I spent about a year and a half out of a variety of different educational settings. I was homeschooled, went to alternative schools, and frankly, at times, went to no school. And you can imagine, by the time I re-enrolled in high school, there were a lot of low expectations that surrounded me. Low expectations that I had for myself, low expectations that some in my family, my father in particular, held for me, and low expectations that unfortunately some in my school community had for me. You know, I was told by my dad that I would probably be a high school dropout. I was told by a guidance counselor that I would flip burgers for a living. And I was told by a teacher, unfortunately, that I would most likely end up in jail or incarcerated. But you know what? I beat those odds, you know, transcended those low expectations. Uh, opposed to being a high school dropout, I, I became a college graduate and graduated from uh, Brown University, which you may or may not know is an Ivy League university. With an honors degree in, of all things, English literature, right? Opposed to flipping burgers, I ended up writing books, the first of which I wrote at the age of 21 as an undergraduate at Brown. And opposed to being an inmate, I became an advocate, somebody who has dedicated his professional life for fighting for and believing in those folks who get the short end of the stick. So I want to spend my time with you this evening celebrating the potential of those kids who learn and live differently. I want to spend my time with you talking about what are the things, investments, commitments that help young folks like me beat those low expectations and prove them wrong. You know, and in my life, it was really three things. You know, first and foremost, I had folks in my life who helped me build a positive self-concept of who I was as a learner. Because there's a lot of negativity that surrounds this experience. I was a kid who believed that because I was different, I was deficient. That I was the stupid, crazy, and lazy kid. But I've come to believe to my core that these things that we have labeled to be deficiencies or disorders aren't that. They are differences in the truest sense of the word. And the thing that really disables individuals is the way that those differences are treated by others. You know, that was true in my life. You know, let's take ADD as an example, right? Hang out with the language, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, it sounds like a bad thing, but you know what, it ain't. It's a difference. There's bad things about it. I'm not naive about the bad things. I struggle with paying attention. I have the attention span of a gnat, okay? Don't let me do your taxes, okay? Not a good use of my cognitive skill set, you know? 
But there's good things about it, things we don't talk enough about. There's research that shows that EMTs, firemen and women with ADD, are better at their job. Better at their job than so-called normal firemen and women. That makes sense. Your house is on fire. You want that dude to have ADD, right? Oh, come get my stuff, you know? Like, listening to directions is highly overrated, do you know? So ADD ain't an intrinsically bad thing. What really disabled me was the way ADD was treated, the way that I was made to feel that I was the bad kid because of that difference. And the same goes true with my so-called learning disability. You know, dyslexia is a difference, good things and bad things about it, but it wasn't the thing that impaired me. The thing that really impaired me wasn't dyslexia, but dystichia, okay? That's what impaired me, you know? What impaired me was the belief that because I struggled with reading, I was the dumb kid. Didn't matter what else I was good at, because I struggled with reading, I was made to feel dumb. Because we have a narrow definition of what constitutes intelligence. We conflate reading and intelligence. We do that in our broader community and, and in our schools. You know, I'm the father of, of three, three boys. My oldest, Max, eight years old, doesn't have that reading brain. Struggling with it and already starting to feel dumb because I live in a community where everybody's got a genius on their hands, right? You know, and how do they know they got baby Einstein at home? It's always one thing, it's always the reading, you know? When I'm hanging out with other moms and dads, I hear things like this. Oh, my kid is so smart, they're reading chapter books and they're in kindergarten, right? Oh, my kid is so smart, they know all their letters and they're three years old. Oh, my kid is so smart, they, they know phonics and, and they're in utero, you know? It, it's, I ain't never hearing my kids so smart they're good at building or talking or connecting or problem solving. It's always one thing and one thing alone. It's a narrow definition. It's reading, which leaves out so many different types of brains. You know, intelligence isn't one thing, it's many things. Some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life, they didn't read well, they didn't write well, but they could rebuild that car engine from scratch, right? And that person, is just as intelligent and just as valuable as that person who got that 4.0. So these were differences, not deficiencies, that became disabled by the way that they were treated. And you know, one of the things that I saw yesterday at Groves is that this is a school that is committed to celebrating these as differences. This is an institution that rebuilds, when necessary, damaged self Concepts. This is a place where some kids may come feeling stupid, crazy, and lazy, and they leave feeling intelligent, comfortable, and valuable. And that changes lives. The other thing I saw when I was at Groves that I know to be true in my life, a foundation of my journey of change was a deep commitment to not just fixing kids' problems, but finding and celebrating and scaling their strengths. And if you listen to any journey of change by somebody like me who grew up in the hallway, it's all about finding that thing that they are good at. You know, I know that from my own story, right? You know, I had this mom in my life. You know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Colleen Mooney. Let me give you a mental image of my mom, okay? Because I love her so much. A lot of folks dismissed my mom in her life and in her journey involved in my education. Dismissed her because she wasn't a tall woman, you know? On a good day in high heels, my mom, she was 4'11", you know? <laughs> Little Irish bulldog. Dismissed my mom because she wasn't a wealthy woman. Raised my brothers and two sisters on welfare in San Francisco. And folks dismissed my mom because she had this funny voice. She had a very high-pitched voice, like Mickey Mouse, right? So people didn't take her seriously. She wasn't tall, she wasn't wealthy, she sounded like Mickey Mouse, but people dismissed my mom at their own peril, right? Because my mother, she cursed like a truck driver, okay? <laughs> and let me ask you all a question. If you were a teacher or a principal, did you want cursing Mickey Mouse in your office? 
The answer to that question is no, but guess where my mom was every day when things were going wrong for her son? Well, she was in that office. How did we know she was in that office? Because every dog in the neighborhood was running away. <laughs> Only bats could hear her high-pitched obscenities. Glass was shattering, right? My mom, she fought for me, and she fought for my right to have an education that was grounded in those strengths, gifts, and talents. To not have a deficit identity that was only about my problems. And I believe to my core that every single human being has a strength, talent, or interest that you can find and you can build a life on. And I really learned that. Doesn't matter who the kid is, it could be misapplied, right? It could be buried. I really learned that from this kid named Juan that I work with in LA. I'll tell you about him. I met Juan when he was 18, and he was driven to a program I was running to help uh, at-risk young people launch successful adults by his probation officer. Because he was arrested when he was 13 for running a 50-person drug ring in South LA. And a serious narcotics dealer, right? He grew up in special ed. He couldn't read. He couldn't write. So he left school, and he joined the family business. And he went to jail, and he served his time. And he got out, and he came to our interview, and he said, what I did was wrong. I want to do something different with my life, but I am dumb. I am not good at anything. And I looked right at Juan and said, Juan, 50-person drug ring? I said, you're an entrepreneur, brother. I mean, look, I was honest with Juan. I said, hey, man, we got to get you a new product, you know? We got to get you some hoodies or some stocks or something to sell. But we can work with that, man. So Juan enrolled in a small business set of coursework at a community college. He studied graphic design, combined the two, created a small business to help advertising firms communicate with urban youth. And that guy is earning a legitimate living wage right now. Did we fix what was wrong with Juan? Nuh uh. We scaled what was right. And that's what Groves is all about. You know, I walked into school the other day and I saw a poster that said, find your strengths and compensate for your weaknesses. That's what that school is all about. You know, that was my journey. You know, I spell at a third grade level. I write books for a living. How do I square that? Well, guess what? I married my spell checker, okay? <laughs> it's called strategic mating, and if you haven't tried it, you should try it. This is a place that is ferociously committed to their strengths, gifts, and talents. This is a place where it's not about what's wrong with kids, but what's right. And last but not least, you know, this is a place, and I know this from my personal journey, that has adults and professional teachers that believe in young people sometimes before they even believe in themselves. And that's what makes all the difference. You know, I know that from my own life. You know, I'm here today because of multiple teachers, but I want to tell you about one of them, a guy named Father Young. Met Father Young at a tipping point in my life where I could have went left, but I went right. You know, first college before Brown, Iowa Marymount University. Went there on soccer scholarship, thought I was a dumb jock, couldn't be anything but that. And on the first day on campus, the soccer coach made us go around to the different departments and listen to the presentations. And I went around and I didn't listen to anything until I got to the English department and the chair of the department, Father Young, was up there talking about literature and learning like his head was on fire. And I was moved. So I went up to him afterwards and I said, Father Young, you, you moved me. I think I might want to be an English major here at LMU, but I don't know if I can do it. I don't read well, I don't write well, I don't spell well. And the guy looked right at me and said, I believe in you. Some of the most gifted thinkers in the world, WBH, John Irving, they were thinkers like you. You can do this. So I was changed. That moment, I walked across campus to the other side to the dean of academic enrollment. I walked into that guy's office, and I said, I'm going to study me some English literature here at LMU, right? <laughs> it, it, it is game time. Let's do this, you know? And that guy, he pulled out my file, right? Y'all know the file? If you go to a special ed like I did, you have the Individualized Education Plan, the IEP, right? Got to be honest about that thing. NSA, KGB, got nothing on the IEP, okay? <laughs> the 
they've been doing deep intel on me my whole life, it ain't good news in that file. <laughs> it's this thick. He flips through it, he laughs, and he says, English literature, I won't approve that major. You should consider something less intellectual. So I was deflated like a balloon, back to the kid in the hallway, went outside, walked back across campus to Father Young, and said, don't worry about that piece of paper I asked you to sign, not going to be an English major. And he said, why? I said, that guy thinks it's too hard because of my disabilities. Father Young was real quiet. Then he looked at me and he said in a way that only an old school Jesuit can, he said, well, son, I guess you're just going to have to prove that bastard wrong. And, and the next day I enrolled in four English literature classes. And that guy who told me I should consider something less intellectual, let's just say that he has an autographed copy of both of my books on his desk right now, right? <laughs> Groves is filled with Father Youngs, filled with committed educators armed with the best practices who believe in young people, who see their best self, hold them accountable to that best self, and transform lives. And we need that more than ever. Because let me tell you, those kids who ride that short bus, those kids like me, those kids have strengths and talents that we need as a country more than ever. 50% of small businesses, 50% in America, are run by people with a language-based learning disability. 50%. 85% of students at prestigious art colleges, RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, elsewhere, are people with cognitive differences. I was told by a dean, that 30% of MIT has ADHD, and the other 70% has Asperger's, right? <laughs> these are entrepreneurs. These are problem solvers. These are innovators. These are people who will change our world. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Right on.